Hello students, today we're going to finish talking about chapter 5 and start talking about chapter 6, SN1 and SN2 chemistry. So uh, this will be a review of yesterday's lecture, which was uh, Wednesday, February 19th, and we're going to finish chapter 5. Finish chapter 5 and also start chapter 6. Chapter 6 is really, really important, so um, make sure you understand basis of it, which is what I'm going to talk about today. We'll continue finishing talking about the basics on Monday, and then we're actually going to start doing some real stuff with it towards chapter 6 and 7, so it's really important. So let's finish chapter 5. Last time for chapter 5, we were talking about stereochemistry, uh, specifically enantiomers and diastereomers, but there's one other type of compound that we didn't talk about, and that was a meso compound. Right. Meso compounds uh, are not that complicated. Uh, I asked you to do the homework because I think you're capable of doing it even without this little knowledge of meso compounds because they're really not that difficult. Essentially, a meso compound <coughs> is a compound that has more than two chiral centers, or greater than or equal to two chiral centers, and it also necessarily has an internal plane of symmetry. That's all it is. So essentially, if there's any place in the molecule that you can draw a dotted line, and one side of the dotted line looks exactly like the other, and it has two chiral centers, it's a meso compound. Meso compounds, by definition, are achiral, because they have that symmetry. So here's a good example. Cyclopentane diol. I do this. This is a chiral center, four different groups attached. It's a chiral center, four different groups attached. I can draw a dotted line right down the middle. The left half is exactly mirroring the other half. So this is the S configuration, this is the R configuration. If you pause the video and prove it to yourself, that'd be a good idea. <coughs> so that you remember how to do that. So in this case, the SR form is what we call the meso form. Um, normally, if you have two chiral centers, every chiral center can have two possible configurations, namely R or S. That would mean that the maximum number of permutations that you can get per mathematics is 2 to the n, right? So if I had two chiral centers, 2 to the n would be 2 to the 2, which would be four possible commutation permutations. What are they? It would be R, S, S, R, S, S, and R, R, right? Those are all the possibilities. But because of this meso constraint, where sometimes molecules have internal plane of symmetry, you no longer have 2 to the n, but you have less than that. And like I said in lecture yesterday, I have yet to come up with a mathematical manipulation that will allow you to calculate the number of actual unique stereoisomers for n number of chiral centers. So I'm still working on it. If you come up with a system, please share it with me. But it's not a mathematically simple problem. So anyway, <coughs> in this case, the SR is the same as the RS. So if I were to draw this molecule, and I just draw a dash, and I do OH and OH. I still have the same plane of symmetry, but if I take this whole molecule and I just flip it over, right, 180 degrees, I flip it over the plane of the ring, the OHs would line up again, so the RS is the exact same as the SR. So the RS is the same as the SR, and so these two things are the same as each other, and we call it the meso form. So this guy would be an enantiomer, this one would be his brother, the enantiomer, where all S's turn to R's, all R's turn to S's. And the only other form you have would be the meso form in this case. Normally, what we would say is that the relationship between any one of these two enantiomers and any one of these two enantiomers would be that of diastereomers. But because it's a meso form, this is no longer true. Right? We only have enantiomers and meso form for this particular compound. And we only have three unique stereoisomers, namely RR, SS, and SR, which is the same as RS. It does not matter. Okay. So we could do the same thing for a molecule like this one. Dibromobutane. So I'll draw it this way. And I'll say, how many total stereoisomers are there? Well, the first thing you want to do is identify all chiral centers. Then you say, well, 2 to the n 
would be 2 to the 2. So potentially I could have 4. That's only on the condition that I cannot generate an internal plane of symmetry, giving me a meso form, which happens to be the case here. <coughs> um, we have RR, SS as the enantiomer. So those guys are the enantiomers of each other. And then in this case, RS is the same as SR. It may not look like there's a plane of symmetry here, but if you imagine rotating this bond such that the flat goes down to the dash, the dash goes all the way around to the wedge, and the hydrogen that's not drawn goes to the dash, you can draw it this way. So keep the one on the left the same. Since you've rotated the molecule now, you would get this. And now it's very easy to identify, ah, there's the mirror plane, therefore this is the meso compound. So if I say what type of stereoisomer is this, you always pick the highest energy, I sh shouldn't say highest energy, the highest um, descriptive one, I guess. So this would be the meso form, and if I gave you one of these guys, the SS or the SR, so the SS, for example, would look like this. It's a BR. NPR, right? If I gave you that as the SS, then you would say that's an enantiomer. Okay. All right, so that's a couple examples of meso compounds. That's really all it is. It's just uh, more than two chiral centers and internal plane of symmetry. You can have chirality even if you don't have chiral centers. So I'm gonna s I'm gonna change the order at which I did uh, <coughs> at which I did in lecture yesterday, and I just want to give you a few examples of chiral molecules that do not have chiral centers. So here's here's one of the ones I used yesterday. Okay. So you have bromine up here on top, iodine down here on the bottom. And that's bonded to, I don't know how good this drawing is going to be, but hoping to give you a little bit of perspective. I'm hoping that this ring that I'm drawing right now is kind of laying on its side. So it looks like it's coming out at us and going back away from us. Okay. And then back here we have a bromine, and then up here we have an iodine. Okay. This is a chiral molecule. Why is it chiral? Well, we don't have any chiral centers, but the molecule does not have free rotation around this bond, right? This rotation does not happen. Why is that? Because this bromine will physically bump into this bromine, this iodine will physically bump into this iodine, they occupy the same area in space, and they're just too large, they can't fit. So essentially, this molecule is locked in a con conformation that says the one on the right is going in out and the one on the left is going uh, up down. And since the bromine and the iodine make the molecule asymmetrical about the length axis, right, bromine does not match iodine, now it's unique. So this molecule is inherently very different than this molecule. This would be his nantumor. And we'll keep uh, these guys the same this time. Oops, this should just be not a wedge. I don't know, hopefully it doesn't look like it should be a stick, right? So the left has remained the same, but now I've rotated essentially this bond and flipped it over so the iodine is in the back. This is a different molecule than this one. And just by looking at it, you can superimpose the left half by sliding this molecule on top of this one, but then the right half would not superimpose. No chiral centers, but it is a chiral molecule. Same thing for one of the uh, questions I gave you on the test. Right, on exam one, I gave you uh, propadiene that looks like this. I ask you to draw the molecular orbital diagram. If this c these carbons are sp2 hybridized, but the middle carbon is sp hybridized, so that means he has a p orbital that goes up and he has a p orbital that goes out. So his p orbital that goes up interacts with this one, so that's in the plane but then he has a p orbital that goes out that matches this one that's in front of the plane and that's why this carbon is quote unquote twisted and that's why we see a wedge here and a dash here and it's flat here and it's flat here so essentially what it's saying is that um, these are all in the plane of each other but then this carbon is rotated 90 degrees relative to this carbon 
and so the P system. Again, no chiral centers, but a chiral molecule, because the one on the right is up and down, whereas I could have drawn it the other way. The one on the left is up and down, so H3, C, H, H, C, H3. So it looks like that, right? Those are two different orientations of the space, right? And so give you two different molecules. All right, so just a couple examples of uh, <laughs> achiral molecules, or excuse me, chiral molecules that have no chiral centers. All right, we'll come back to what I talked about next in lecture, which is optical activity. Let's go to the next page. Optical activity. This is kind of the whole reason or one of the qualitative methods that we have to determine things about stereochemistry. So we have uh, an instrument in chemistry that will actually measure the optical activity of a given sample. The instrument works like this. You start out with a light bulb. Be jealous of my light bulb drawing skills. <coughs> and then we have a monochrometer, right? A mono, mono, that's an N, monochrometer. Mono means one, chromatic means light. Right. So only one wavelength of light is allowed through the monochrometer. That's the point of the monochrometer. It says, okay, pick some wavelength, whatever you want, doesn't matter. Only light of that wavelength is going to be allowed through. The light that gets through the monochrometer is polarized in all directions, up, down, left, right, in, out, diagonal, etc., etc. And so we have to add one more thing, which is a polarizing filter. Typically we draw a picture of a polarizing filter like this. This is the same exact filter that will be in your sunglasses. So let's see if I can check out these sweet sunglasses. Okay, so you have sunglasses that you put on your face, right? And the filter is a polarizing filter if you have those fancy ones. All it does is take the light that's coming in and say only light that's oscillating in a very specific orientation in space will be allowed to pass through. So if you take your two sunglass lenses, you take them out, rotate one 90 degrees relative to the other, and then stack them on top of each other, one will only allow light in one orientation, the other one will only allow light in the 90 degree rotation of that orientation, and therefore no light will get through. Right? The monochrometer combined with the polarizing filter essentially will do the same thing. So the, the light that makes it through the monochrometer is only oscillating in one direction. Then we have our sample tube. So we're going to put our sample tube in. This is where we're going to put our actual sample in the liquid phase. It has some size. And the sample will contain some enantiomers. So this will be sample. Right, so let's say we have um, just like the R form. Right? At, the, at the end of the sample tube, the light that comes out, after it interacts with the sample, will hit the detector. And the detector will say, initially the light was going exactly up and down, which is zero degrees. When it came out of the sample, the light was rotated by some amount, perhaps 30 degrees. And so we have a 30 degree rotation of the light, and so we say then that the R form rotates the light to the right in this example, and therefore we say that the R form is what we call dextro rotatory. The way that we represent that with a symbol is the plus symbol. If it rotates the light to the left, so maybe not, so if the R form rotates the light to 30 degrees to the right, then the L form, excuse me, the S form would necessarily rotate the light exactly 30 degrees to the left, which would be just a negative value. We would call that levo rotatory. And the symbol we use for that is a minus sign. So occasionally you'll see this in the name of a molecule if you're looking through the textbook, if you're looking online, or if you're looking, you know, on the internet or whatever. Um, it's technically not part of the name, but it does help be a little bit descriptive. So you, meet, you might see a name written down something like this. S plus 2 butanol, right? The IUPAC name is just S2 butanol, but a lot of organic chemists will insert that little plus to say the S form in this case is dextrorotatory, right? It is not the case that R and S are directly tied to any particular type of rotation. Right, so sometimes R can be positive, sometimes S can be positive, sometimes R can be negative, sometimes S can be negative. There's no correlation between R and S, 
and dextro and levo. Okay, so that's an important thing to remember. We also have a few equations that we can use to make some unique calculations about these things, which if you're in lab you might actually do this. I'm not actually going to ask you to ever do any calculations, I just want to show you the calculations or show you the, the formulas so you kind of see how it's used, but that's all I'm going to do with it. So for every molecule we can measure something that we call the specific rotation. It's a property that's unique to the molecule and it's independent of our sampling abilities, like our concentrations and things like that. And so <coughs> What we do is we take the sample that we have in our tube and we measure some value. We call that alpha observed, right? So 29 degrees, 17.2 degrees, negative 2.3 degrees, doesn't matter. And we just divide that by the concentration of our sample and the length of the sample tube. That will allow us to calculate a value that we can use kind of as a standard and we can report it in the literature and so different people can compare their specific rotation, specific rotation. People can compare these values to each other. So they say, oh, I did this synthesis and I got this molecule and it has this melting point and this IR values and, or these are IR values and it has this specific rotation. And then someone else does it and says, oh, I got this melting point, but I had this specific rotation. Something is going on, right? And you can kind of use that to backwards deduce the quality of the, um, of the synthesis to say, oh, yours isn't as good because you have the side product showing up, which is messing up the enantiomers or whatever. Additionally, sometimes you can do chemistry with achiral molecules that will lead you to generate <coughs> chiral centers. Let me show you an example. If I take this molecule, this is 2-butanone, okay, and I add H2, so hydrogen. When I add H2, there's two ways that I can add it. Now you don't know about this mechanism yet. You're not going to learn it until Ocon 2, so don't worry about it. But essentially what H2 does is it takes this pi system, right, the pi orbital that we talked about in molecular orbital theory, and the hydrogens just sit down on top of that pi orbital. When they do so, they can sit down on the top lobe, or they could sit down on the bottom lobe. Hydrogen doesn't have any reason to pick one lobe over the other. So you would think <coughs> that naturally you would get a 50-50 chance because it could be half of the chances it can go on the top, half the chances it go on the bottom. There's no particular reason it should go to one side versus the other. So if the hydrogen interacts on the top side of the molecule, what you end up getting is a structure that looks like this. I'm just going to write ET for ethyl, right? An ethyl group is that. I'm just going to write ET because I'm running out of space. If the hydrogen reacts on the bottom side, now the structure that you get looks like this. Okay. Those are, actually, I'm going to draw this differently. I'm going to put this one up here. There we go, ET. Those are two different structures, and we've generated chiral centers. So f where there was prior no chirality, now we've generated chirality. Unfortunately, we, haven't, we don't have a way to control the chirality in this example because the chance that the hydrogen interacts on the top is just 50-50 chance with it reacting on the bottom. So we kind of just throw our hands in the air and say, well, I'm going to get a mixture of both of these. How much percentage-wise of the top structure will I get? 50%. How much of the bottom structure will I get? 50%. And so the product of its reaction yields a 50-50 mixture of both enantiomers, And what we call that, when that happens, is a racemic mixture. It means you have two enantiomers in a given sample, <coughs> and they both exist at a 50-50 concentration. If I go back and say, okay, take that sample and put it in the sample tube from above, what would you expect the amount of rotation of the light to be? You should be saying zero because the R enantiomer will rotate the light in one particular direction, but you have the exact same amount of the S enantiomer, and so it will rotate the light right back in the exact opposite direction and the same magnitude. And so whatever the R does, the S will undo it. Or if you like to pick on the S, you could say whatever the S does, the R will undo it, and they will cancel each other out. So our specific rotation for a racemic mixture will be zero degrees. So if you do some chemical reaction, <coughs> and then you do calculate the specific rotation, and you say, hey, wait a minute, I, uh, 
I have zero here, it means two things. It either means you don't have any chirality at all. I guess technically it means three things. No chirality at all. It means you have a meso compound, which you should know through the chemistry itself. Or it means you have a racemic mixture, and you need to investigate further. But what happens if you had, let's say, a 75-25 mixture, where it wasn't 50-50? Now, one of them will uh, rotate the light more than the other is able to unrotate it. Right. Well, we can calculate what we call enantiomeric excess, meaning how much of one enantiomer do we have more than the other. And we can do that by just taking our lambda, excuse me, our alpha observed from our actual experiment above, and we just divide it by the rotation of the pure enantiomer by itself. So we have to have the pure form, such as the pure R or the pure S, and we multiply by 100 because we want it as a percentage of excess. <coughs> So if it comes out to be zero, then it's zero divided by whatever the rotation of the pure enantiomer is, doesn't matter. Your enantiomeric excess is zero, so you have zero more R than you have S. But if your specific observation is, um, or your lambda observation is some positive value, say five, and you divide it by the rotation of the pure enantiomer, maybe 15, five over 15 is one third, so one third times 100 would be 33%, so you have 33% more of whichever one gives you 15 degrees positive rotation than you do the other one, right? So that's how you use it. I'm not going to ask you to use it. I just kind of want to point out that you can you can use a couple of simple equations and a relatively simple instrument, right? These things are actually monochromators. Um, optical activity devices are, are pretty cheap as chemistry instruments go. And it's a pretty simple test, right? You just take your sample in liquid form, put it in, and then press a few buttons on the computer, and you get some readout, right? It's really simple. You don't really have to do a lot of work to make it happen. Okay. So that's that. The last topic in chapter 5. Let's see, the last chapter, last section. Come on, let's do thing. Will be Fisher projections. F I S C H E R. Again, a projection, just like a, a big screen projector or a movie projector, is just a way to put a three dimensional structure uh, into a two dimensional image. Right? So it's a 2D way to represent a 3D molecule. So, for example, if I draw this, CH2OH and OH and CH3 and hydrogen, right? That's one way that we draw three-dimensional structures uh, as two-dimensional. We use this dash and wedge nomenclature to say, imagine this is pointing at you, and imagine this is going away. Now you kind of know what the molecule looks like. The Fisher projection is another way to do that, but instead of drawing it kind of this way, where you have two lines that are flat, a dash and a wedge. Instead, what it does is say, imagine taking this molecule and taking this top group and pushing it back into the paper. So that way, your hydrogen kind of swings up out at you, and your OH group will swing up out at you, and it will give you something that looks like this. It will give you two groups that are dashed and two groups that are wedges. So essentially you're just changing the way you're viewing the molecule. You're not changing the stereochemistry, you're just changing how you're looking at it. Okay, So you just push that group back so that the OH swings up, the H swings up, and then you're looking at it kinda down this axis so that the methyl group is down below, the CH2OH is up on top behind. So you get something like that. The way you draw a Fisher projection is just draw a plus sign or a giant T or a cross or whatever you want to call it and then insert the groups and draw like you're a four-year-old. CH2OH. This is the computer, it's not me, trust me. I, I know how to write. I don't know why it does that. Maybe it needs to be recalibrated. I don't know, it doesn't matter. So this would be the Fisher projection of the molecule over here. It's very, it's helpful when you're doing sugar chemistry and when you're doing biochemistry, although personally I don't find it that helpful for doing organic chemistry, and so I'm not going to stress it. I will teach it. Uh, I will ask you one or two questions about it on the test. You might see it on the ACS exam, but I'm not going to go crazy with it. If you take biochem or you move on in chemistry, you'll probably see them some more, um, and you can, you can have more fun with them. Learn. But me personally, I'm not a fan of them. The way that I remember the Fisher projections, like what means what, the little man with the bow tie. Right, so the little man is happy because he's dressed up, looking, looking snazzy. He wears a bow tie. Right, so that's the guy. So when you do this, you can imagine the things that are on the horizontal axis 
those things are coming out at you and then the things above and below are going back behind the plane of the paper. So just to prove yourself that you know how to do this, do that again, draw this molecule as a Fisher projection and then we'll be done with Fisher projections. Okay. Go ahead and pause the video and help if I give you all the molecules. Pause the video and draw the corresponding Fisher projection. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to push this back. I'm going to pull that up. So a Fisher projection would mean hydrogen would be here. This goes up to here. The methyl ends up down at the bottom as a dash, and COOH ends up here. If I wanted to draw the enantiomer of this molecule, it's very easy to do. And this is one of the benefits of Fisher projections, I'll give it that. If you rotate 90 degrees, 90 degree rotation, you necessarily generate the enantiomer. So if I draw the same thing, I take the COOH, and I put it here, that one there, that one there, that one there. I get this structure. Because I'm holding the dashes and the wedges the same, oops, this one becomes OH, this becomes CH3. Because I'm holding the dashes and the wedges the same, essentially all my dashes have become wedges, all my wedges become dashes in terms of what they're attached to, and so I flipped the stereocenter. So this would be one enantiomer, this would be the other enantiomer. So a 90 degree rotation about a Fisher projection necessarily gives you the enantiomer. A 180 degree rotation, so that would be another 90 degrees, so this one goes here, this one goes here, it goes there, it goes there, would put, let's see, it would put OH here, put COOH down here, it would put H here, and CH3 up here, right? This returns you to the original enantiomer because you only have two flavors, right? You have R and S, or S and R, whichever is one to which, it doesn't matter. So if you flip it and then flip it back, these two now are the same as each other. And you can prove that because if you take this and rotate it 180 degrees, what do you get? You get COOH at the top, you get CH3 at the bottom, the OH ends up over on the left, and the H ends up at the right. This is the exact same thing as this. 180 degree rotation is the same molecule. All you're doing is essentially turning the paper upside down and looking at it from a different point of view. 90 degree rotation is changing the definition of what it used to be. So here it used to be a dash, because this is a dash, right? That's what this is supposed to be, a dash. And when you put it here, you're turning it into a wedge. So you're actually flipping the stereochemistry when you do a 90 degree rotation of the Fisher projections. That's one of the benefits of the Fisher projections. That's really all it's used for. So I'm going to stop there because I'm done with that. That's boring. All right, time to move on to what might be my favorite chapter in organic chemistry, chapter 6, alkyl halides and nucleophilic substitution. So SN1, SN2, and E1 and E2. Those are the big hitters. So the topics that we're going to deal with are going to be oops, S subscript 1 and S subscript 2, N2, SN1, SN2. E1 and E2. Those are the big hitters. That's really the whole point of this entire chapter. In order to be able to understand some of these things, we have to understand the idea of basicity, not basicity, but basicity, and we'll compare that to nucleophilicity. So you remember, I don't know, some number of weeks ago, <coughs> I asked you to learn the term nucleophile and electrophile. That's where these are going to come in. Uh, this chapter, a nucleophile is an atom that prefers to make a bond to a carbon rather than to a hydrogen. We need to understand polarizability. Uh, we're also going to look at rearrangements. Molecules, rearrangements. Molecules don't always behave the way you want them to because they're jerks. Then we're going to learn a little bit of nomenclature through what we call Zaitsev's rule. It's a pretty neat little rule. And then finally, we're going to start doing what I call real organic chemistry. Introduction to synthesis. All right, so there's our topics. All right, so let's start with SN2. SN2 stands for substitution, substitution, nucleophilic, Bimolecular. Right. 
Substitution, nucleophilic bimolecular. That means in the rate determining step, the step that goes slowest in the mechanism, you need two molecules to make it happen. What is the type of reaction we're doing? It's a substitution reaction, so we're taking something off the molecule and replacing it with something else. And how are we doing that? We're doing that with nucleophilic chemistry. Okay, so there are four major factors that you need to consider when you're doing SN1, SN2, um, yeah, SN1, SN2 chemistry. So four factors. These are incredibly important. Please commit these to your brain. You have to know this. The nucleophile, how good is it? The leaving group, how good is it? The substrate, how favorable is it to allow for the chemistry to occur? And the last one is the solvent. Does it help or does it hinder the chemistry? If you, those four factors are all aligned properly, you can do SN2 chemistry very well. If those factors tend to disagree with each other, and some of them promote SN2 chemistry, and some of them prevent SN2 chemistry, then you'll kind of have a hindered reaction that may or may not work depending upon the promotion and the prevention. Let's take a look at a generic SN2 mechanism, right? So it's a mechanism, so we're using our curly arrows. The generic SN2 mechanism is very simple. We're starting with some nucleophile, and it has to have a lone pair of electrons. Uh, the nucleophile, by definition, wants to make a bond to a carbon. So we need a carbon that has some things attached, but one of the necessary things it has to have attached is a leaving group. Uh, we'll talk about quality of leaving groups in a minute. For now, I'm just going to use LG to represent leaving group. The carbon that's going to be making the bond is called the substrate. Right, that's number three here. This carbon and all the things that are attached to him is called the substrate, and it necessarily has to be sp3 uh, hybridized. Uh, when you do the chemistry, the nucleophile will attack the carbon. That's what we call it, a backside attack. Carbon, of course, cannot have more than eight electrons, two, four, six, eight. So it's gaining two, so it has to lose two. When the leaving group leaves, you generate a transition state that looks something like this. Oh, come on, you stupid pen. Okay, so that gives the nucleophile has a partial negative charge because it's a lone pair of electrons. The leaving group is taking these two electrons with it, so it has a partial negative charge. And the carbon is stuck in the middle, so it has a partial positive charge. At the end of the day, you've made a bond between the nucleophile and the carbon. And then the leaving group has left, and he took his electrons with it. Okay. During the course of this um, mechanism, the carbon goes from being sp3 hybridized to being sp, <laughs> seriously, this pen is nonsense, sp2 hybridized inside the uh, transition state. And then it goes back to being sp3 hybridized after the reaction is complete. So essentially it swings from being sp3 to sp2 back to sp3 very quickly. If we draw the reaction coordinate diagram, which I'll do on the left side so my pen doesn't act all stupid. Start out with some energy. We're going up. Not all substitution or uh, SN2 chemistry are exothermic. I'm just drawing one as exothermic for now to give us a double dagger. This is our transition state. This is where this is this the fleeting sp2 moment in the life of the carbon that we were just talking about. Okay, so let's talk about that first factor, the nucleophile. What makes a good nucleophile? <sighs> I don't know what that is. Good nucleophile. It's not an easy question, and that's because a good nucleophile has to be able to make bonds to a carbon, right? So it has to have a lone pair of electrons. Those electrons, you would think, need to be high enough energy so that they can actually do this arrow. They actually do this attack. And so we want one high energy electrons. So that would be a helpful factor for a good nucleophile. But we also want what we call polarizable. Polarize polarizable electrons. Right. Why is that important? <coughs> That's important because the electrons 
cannot be so rigidly held by this nucleophile that they can't like kind of flop around in space, right? Even though we draw this mechanism, like there's only the substrate and there's only the nucleophile in the solution, that's not really true, right? There's hundreds of millions of billions of nucleophiles, there's hundreds of millions of billions of molecules of substrate, and then there's billions of billions of billions of molecules of solvent that are getting in the way trying to stop this from happening. And so we need to have the electron's ability to move around inside the orbital in which they exist to be flexible enough to kind of squiggle around through solution and get close enough to the carbon to make a bond. If they're held so rigidly in space that they cannot that they cannot move through space and get close enough to have that carbon, they will not be very polarizable and therefore they will not be a good nucleophile. And the last factor that we need for a good nucleophile is small molecular size. Now, I'm not, when I say molecular size, I mean everything that's attached to the nucleophile, not just the nucleophilic atom in and of itself, right? So, for example, here's some examples of good nucleophiles. OH- minus has negative charge, um, so it's high energy electrons. It's not terribly polarizable because our electrons are in an sp3 hybrid orbital, specifically an sp3 hybrid orbital that's made from a 2p orbital and a 2s orbital, so it's not very large in terms of size, but the energy of the electrons kind of compensates for the lack of polarizability. It's only two atoms big, one atom of which is a hydrogen, so it's essentially negligible, so it's relatively small. So it has three factors going, two good factors going for it, the high energy electrons and the small molecular size. Polarizability isn't so good, but number one, huge high energy electrons compensates for it. SH minus, also a good nucleophile. Again, high energy electrons because you have uh, negative charge. Uh, it's only two atoms big, so it's got the same thing going for it that oxygen has, or the OH case. However, sulfur makes its sp3 hybrid orbital from the 3s orbital and the 3p orbital, which gives you an sp3 hybrid orbital, which is a little bit larger than the sp3 hybrid orbital that is that exists for oxygen. And so these electrons are a little bit more polarizable, meaning the orbitals are a little bit bigger. But at the same time, because the orbitals are bigger, the energy is a little bit lower. And that's actually what makes OH- a better base than SH-. Uh, other examples, iodide, bromide, OCH3. You're seeing a trend here? What am I doing? I'm sticking on this negative charge. Even in the small in the inorganic world called hard ions, the oxygens, the uh, nitrogens, right? And those hard ions, um, the uh, high energy electrons is more than enough to compensate for the fact that it's not that polarizable. As the electrons get lower in energy because they're in larger orbitals, like in iodide and bromide, they get more polarized, excuse me, they get more polarizable and therefore make up for the fact that the energy, the electrons aren't as high as energy as they are in OH or SH or NH, etc. Okay. Um, one last example, a nitrile, carbon with a negative charge. Very, very little polarizability, but very, very high energy because carbon is not happy having this negative charge. He just not like that. So those are some examples of good nucleophiles. So they get smiley face. Here's some examples of bad nucleophiles. They get frowny face. Water. The electrons in water are happy just chilling the way they are. It's a stable molecule. It's all over the planet. Um, doesn't want to do chemistry. It's happy like it is. Fluoride. It actually turns out that fluoride is kind of an oddball. Whereas iodide and sulfide and hydroxide and bromide are all good nucleophiles, fluoride is just so damn electronegative that it holds onto those electrons so tight that the electrons are very high energy, but it's so unpolarizable, it just doesn't work. So it's kind of an oddball. It doesn't necessarily fall into the trend that we we're looking at earlier. Alcohols, like ethanol, for example. Neutral molecule, doesn't have particularly high energy electrons. We're talking about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 total atoms now, so molecular size is starting to get up there. And indeed, as you start piling on the atoms, right, like something like this, neutral molecule does not particularly care to be a good nucleophile. 
right? You can see the molecules get bigger and bigger. And even though the nitrogen does have a lone pair of electrons, there's a lot of atoms hanging out with it. It doesn't particularly do a good job, right? So these are all neutral species. The electrons don't really want to react that much, okay? So the important thing we note here is um, good nucleophiles have high energy electrons and ideally are polarizable. So SAH, I minus, Br minus, etc. Um, since we're doing nucleophilic chemistry is based on the ability of the nucleophile to attack this carbon, that's the term we use, um, if we have a strong nucleophile, we're going to push for an SN2 mechanism. Right? Later on, we're going to talk about the SN1 mechanism. It's not in this lecture, but it should be in the next lecture. And then we're going to talk about the leaving group. So let's move on to the leaving group right now. The leaving group has essentially two major factors. The most important one is the ability to stabilize electrons after the leaving group leaves. Okay. That's the number one most important thing. If the leaving group can stabilize electrons very well, it'll be a great leaving group. If it can't, then it won't be such a good leaving group. The other factor that's also helpful is to have some amount of electron withdrawing effect. Essentially, in order for something to be electron withdrawing, does it have electronegative negative elements? So does it have chlorine, fluorine, bromine, iodine, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, etc. Okay. So let's take an example. Let's say we had a carbon, which I'm just going to use R, we had O, CH3, like that. And I, I'm going to take a nucleophile and I'm going to attack here and I'm going to break this bond and I'm going to compare that to a nucleophile that's going to attack my carbon here. Which one will be the better leaving group? Well, after the leaving group leaves, it would give me this. After this leaving group leaves, it would give me this. <laughs> That's terrible looking. Why are you doing that, computer? C H three N. Okay. Which one is more stable? They're both oxygen with a negative charge, right? But jumping out of the page, you should immediately be shouting resonance, resonance, and resonance, and that will be the right answer because this structure is resonance stabilized. You'll necessarily be stabilizing the electrons a lot more. And so this is a much better leaving group than this one. So much so that we almost don't even consider this a leaving group, whereas this one, acetate, is a leaving group. Okay. Same thing is true for non-resonant stabilized issues. If I have iodide and I compare that to fluoride and I say, let's do SN2 nucleophilic chemistry. You attack, you're going to be the leaving group. Some nucleophile is going to attack you, you're the leaving group. I'm generating I minus here, I'm generating F minus here. Which electrons are higher in energy? Well, clearly the F minus is higher in energy because they have the same amount of electrons, namely two, jammed into a tiny little sp3 hybrid orbital, and they're held very tightly by the fluorine, so the energy of these electrons goes way up. Since the iodine electrons are in a 5p or a 5sp3 hybrid orbital, um, the orbital is a lot larger, the energy is a lot lower, and so this is more stable after it has left, and therefore it is a better leaving group. So this is one of the things that gets tricky because if you think about what I said a second ago, I said iodine is a better nucleophile, but it's also a better leaving group. Tricksy, tricksy, things to think about. So a couple examples of good leaving groups. Example of good leaving groups. Obviously things that are resonance stabilized will be very good. So sulfate, phosphate, and bromine since it's electronegative, iodine since it's electronegative, both of which are large enough to, uh, to stabilize that negative charge that forms bromide and iodide. Chlorine is okay, right? You can make it happen. It's not as good as the other two, but it'll do the job. It's in the gray zone. Of course, acetate, like we just talked about, will be good. All the things that are resonance stabilized are good. Those are all good leaving groups, right? So whenever a leaving group can leave as 
some type of stable molecule, that'll be a good thing. Okay. So the next topic we're going to talk about is substrate structure. So that will be number three from our list from above. But I'm going to stop here for today, substrate structure, because that's where we got to in lecture yesterday. So um, I would like everyone to make sure that they can do Chapter 5 homework, which was supposed to be turned in yesterday. And then uh, if you want to start Chapter 6, that would be great. Although if you want to wait, that would be okay too. Wait till we get to the last two topics, substrate and solvent. <coughs> and then we'll start doing some chemistry. Uh, I also handed out take-home quiz uh, number 3. So it's 10 points. It's due on Monday. And I think it was practicing the RS nomenclature stuff. Uh, it will be posted on Canvas, so please make sure if you didn't come to class or you didn't get a copy of it or whatever, that you print it out complete it and turn it on Monday so you can get credit. Alright, so that is it. Have a good weekend guys and I will see y'all on Monday.